Welcome, everybody. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our next our next session, which is with Mayo Clinic, enabling the point of care manufacturing loop, surgeons, radiologists, engineers, and technology management. Um, sitting next to me in another virtual space is um, Amy Alexander. She's a senior biomedical engineer at Mayo Clinic. Um, Amy uses advanced medical segmentation and CAD software to convert 2D radio radiological imaging data and 3D printed anatomical models and surgical guides. Amy chairs the Edu Engineering Education Subcommittee at RSNA 3D SIG, is an advisor on the ASME Medical AM Committee, and is chair of the SME Medical AM 3D Printing Workgroup. She holds a Bachelor's of Science in Biomechanical Engineering from MSOE, and a Master's of Science in Engineering and Management from MSOE as well. Amy is an active manuscript reviewer for Springer's Nature's 3D Printing and Medicine Journal and serves on the MSOE Biomedical Engineering and Industrial Advisory Committee. Amy holds certifications in additive manufacturing from MIT and SME. Um, everybody, Amy, take it from here. Why is anatomic modeling and 3D printing based in radiology for clinical care at Mayo Clinic? Well, we can start with the fact that, of course, you have CT scans or MRI, and you can uh, use them to create very advanced uh, digital imaging or on-screen pictures from that data. Um, if anyone here has ever had an x-ray, um, you're familiar with the fact that they can get one slice of the body in an imaging data set. Um, with a CT, it's essentially a stack of x-rays in a row. So you can get an, a number of images and then interpolate between those to understand the dynamic spatial relationships between the anatomies within the body. Um, once you have that information, um, you've recreated the anatomic structures in 3D, you can use it for surgical task training or medical simulation and high fidelity task training of surgical procedures. You can also correct the files and per perfect them for 3D printing so that you have something that is like tactile, which translates well into surgical training because surgeons work with their hands. And so it makes sense for them to have something to hold because it connects the hands to the eyes, to the brain, and can help them better prepare for what type of surgery they're going to perform. For example, this model of torus mandibularis, it was printed on a Formlabs model in two different pieces. You see the gum or the base denture model, and then the teeth model, which was printed with um, a nice offset that allowed the teeth to fit into the denture base. From there, 3D structures and the meshes that were created in three dimensions and build surgical cutting guides off of a surgical plan that the surgeon does on their own. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that as well as patient specific titanium implants that can be 3D printed and are actively 3D printed in the space now. So we kind of talked about where anatomic models are coming from. I'm going to skip over the gold framed lady. Uh, here we have just a subset of models that can be created from 3D uh, data sets. Uh, you can see that most of them are in Skittle colors, you know, the bright greens, purples, blues, reds, um, but we can also surface scan the models and 3D print them in photorealistic color. Additionally, we can take this one step further from visual aid and make it a surgical simulation model where you have a pelvis and layers of tissue that have been silicone molded in the right thicknesses and similar durometers to help um, simulate the exact process of, in this case, repairing a hernia. The 3D printed surgical cutting guides are what are, can, be, can be 3D printed in autoclavable and biocompatible material and then sterilized and brought into the OR to help the surgeon carry out their plan. So backing up again, we have a black and white data set. Right away, when I, when I do this, um, go to this next slide and you can see the teal pop up, you can see the jawbone, the mandible bone popping out, and even that helps. Then you add in the magenta and it's the pink tumor. You interpolate between those slices of highlighted data and you can get a three-dimensional image. Then you add something like the skull for reference and you can really understand what part of the body you're looking at. So 3D printed anatomic models, um, how do we use them for visual aid and surgical reference? 
Well, in our lab, we have radiologists and radiology technologists. They together will uh, segment out a case uh, that a surgeon has requested a model for. And what you're looking at here is uh, Dr. John Skinner, one of our musculoskeletal radiologists, reviewing segmentation of a pediatric pelvic tumor set. And on the left-hand side, you can see the segmentation of the CT data. And on the right side, you see the three-dimensional model of the pelvis. The next step in modeling would be to 3D print. And most of the group on this call is familiar with that step. This is the pelvis being printed prone um, on an object 500 um, Connex 3. Then, of course, there has to be post-processing. So the healthcare technology management group is a group that can help us to post-process each of the prints that comes off the printer. In the early days, the engineer uh, was responsible for loading up the printers, removing the printed models, cleaning them, documenting them, and delivering them. But now HTM does everything after content development. Once the model is prepared for surgical pickup, it's photographed. Those photographs go into the patient's record and the physician is made aware that the model is ready and then they come in for a consultation with the radiologist who segmented and, and reviewed segmentation for that model. So in 3D printed anatomic guides, we're really looking at the digital side of surgical planning at the front end and then the execution of that plan in the OR. Again, we start with radiological data, segment out the anatomy, so the maxilla and skull, the mandible and the tumor, convert it into a 3D printed or 3D mesh in digital space. And then the next step is the, the surgeon makes a plan to come in and sit down with the engineer. We can do this either digitally or in person with the COVID crisis happening, we've been doing more and more digitally. Um, and we, we try to make it work. It is more effective in person um, sometimes because it's just on the fly and we're there and ready to do the planning whenever the surgeon has a break in between cases. But here you can see Dr. R.C. sitting with me um, planning the osteotomy planes. Once those planes are planned, then we can do what's called a digital resection and remove the bone and the tumor in 3D space. The next step was to have the the surgeon reconstruct the space that was taken out. So the bone that was removed must be reconstructed so that the jaw can be restored for that patient. In this case, they used a left fibular graft to reconstruct the upper right maxilla. Then we get input from the surgeons on what kind of surgical access they'll have to the patient's um, actual bone when they're in the OR, and then they indicate for us where they'd like the guides to sit and where they'd like the guides to have a screw hole so that they can anchor to the bone. Next step is to 3D print. Um, these are printed in our space. It's a Form Labs Form 2 Dental SG resin, 0.05 millimeter height, uh, with supports at 0.8 and 0.8 density and point size. Um, to print them, they have to be cured and or washed and then cured. Then they're sterilized uh, via autoclave in uh, the surgical cores and then brought directly into the operating room. The next three slides are going to have surgical Please um, avert your eyes if you are squeamish. So here you can see um, a use of a surgical fixation tray on the right side. The flaps were taken from that lower leg and then reconstructed in the maxillary space. And a 3D printed titanium plate was used to secure the, the two flaps, the two fibular segments to the maxilla. And also on the left, you can see a 3D printed custom orbital floor plate that was used for the same purpose. The bony reconstruction is the most important part of the, uh, of the graft surgery, and they need to make sure that there's good bony contact um, with the surgical guides that help carry the surgical saws through at those exact locations and angles. They can get, um, they, they consider it almost a perfect contact with the bone, which um, enables longevity of life of the flap. Finally, you have post-operative imaging we're away from the surgical slides now, we're back to normal, guys. Um, we have post-operative Panorex imaging that shows the implants, um, the, three, the three slots on the top are the actual dental implants, and then you can kind of see that C-shape, that's the, uh, the 3D printed titanium plate. 
So I did want to give a nod to uh, the Division of Engineering because they're the group that started 3D printing at Mayo Clinic in 2006 in response to a set of conjoined twins who shared a liver. In 2007, they also had a set of conjoined twins who shared an anterior chest wall. And you can imagine the, um, the helpfulness, the, the incredible comprehension that comes with a 3D printed model of something that's not only do you have the shape and the geometry, you have the size. And so in pediatric patients, these are, you know, five month, eight month old babies, their liver is not the size of an adult liver. It's a very small object. And so to have that in, in your hands can help you plan, as you can see in the lower right hand corner where they're holding the two chest walls. The Division of Engineering also did some work from 2006 to 2009 to design and then send out for mass manufacturing via injection mold, I'm sorry, via milling, um, a temporal mandibular joint. So in many patients, the joint begins to deteriorate uh, due to cancers or other afflictions. And in order to continue having um, the ability to chew, talk, smile, laugh, etc., you do need a, a nice uh, smooth joint between your TMJ and um, your occiput, so you do need to create something that's smooth. Um, they were able to 3D print the prototypes and then have them made out of the titanium alloy. From 2008 to 2013, the Division of Engineering continued to help radiology with their 3D prints, and they printed spines and other orthopedic cases, and then they got into oncology. You can see on the right hand side there's a pelvis pelvis model and the large gray mass in the front is a tumor. What we've learned is that most of the cases that we have are either for cancerous tumors or for craniofacial reconstruction, both of which I've shown you today. So now I want to show the growth of 3D printing and radiology and how we added essential team members from the radiology, surgery, engineering, and HTM, healthcare technology management spaces. So in 2015, 2013 to 2015, we had one printer, engineer, and two physicists. And then on, on the side, I have um, the administrator level uh, jobs because these people were absolutely instrumental in keeping the lab going, but they were all pretty much voluntary at that time. In 2016, we added a second printer and another member of HTM. In 2017, we added one radiology technologist and two more printers. Next year, two more printers, two more radiology technologists. In 2018, we added another engineer as well as another radiology technologist. And, and this year, we've got um, 10 full-time people, including and or not including our medical director, and um, a fleet of printers that were selected not based on anything other than what the surgical needs are. Um, we don't just pick a printer because it's flashy or cool. We have to listen to what the surgeons need in terms of material properties and biomimicry, and then we go from there. So I want to highlight what HTM does for us. So when in 2015, when I was the only engineer, I spent most of my time, um, you know, maintaining the printers and cleaning the models. And this is just um, what we've got in terms of post-processing. Uh, equipment for 2020 in our new 7,000 square foot um, manufacturing lab in the hospital. Now we have three full-time 1.0 FTE people to help load content, clean content, and maintain all of our equipment. I did want to give a shout out to Mr. Scott Christian. Uh, if anybody knows this middle picture, then you are a Stratasys uh, customer. You're familiar with having to clean the heads on the Stratasys printer. Um, Scott had this genius idea to create something that would hold the isopropyl alcohol up under the print heads for a little bit longer than he could do with his own hand um, so that he could walk away from the printer while it was soaking and work on other things. He actually designed this apparatus with his son in Tinkercad at home and then brought it to us and we 3D printed it and they are still using it today. So it shows how the, the background of people in the healthcare technology management field is so robust and so diverse that they're, if hired and if brought onto the team, they're going to improve efficiency and they're going to innovate on the fly. 
like I mentioned before, we do also do a lot of um, 3D printing and then molding off of those 3D prints. So here you can see um, another project that HTM was deeply involved with, including um, Andrew Dewitt, Eric Erie, and my co-engineer Hunter Dickens. The, they molded a lifelike simulator for ECMO cannulation task training. Again, they improved upon that design and said, well, do we really need to mold the entire pelvis or can we 3D print the bulk of the structures and then just mold smaller pieces that are going to be cannulated because those pieces are going to be, need to be replaced um, as often as the training is happening. And so another example of uh, supreme innovation here. So with that, I hope I didn't go over my time. Uh, Janet, everyone, thank you for your patience. I appreciate you staying on and uh, to the bitter end with us, and I hope you have a great day. No worries, Amy. We still have Q&A for you, and we are pushing the schedule by about five to ten minutes, so no worries about that. Are you All right. Ready? Are you ready for questions? Yeah. Great. So you mentioned the tax will ask. Sorry about that. You mentioned the uh, the tactile aspect of the model of the models as surgical tools are the different colors printed with different materials to present a realistic feel. Yes. Um, so depending on what technology is requested, uh, we can print in different durometers, different shore values. Um, on our object five hundred times three, we can print down to a shore A twenty seven in their Agilis material up to, I think it's a short A90 in their Vero, and then about 10 steps in between that. Um, when we need to get softer than a short A27, like what I've been told is that the palm of your hand right here by your thumb is about a short A5. So if you need to get softer than a short A27, then you're gonna need to be molding in a material that isn't 3D printed. Unless you have a silicone 3D printer, which is really not, I'm not super familiar with, but I know that ASIO has one with Wacker materials. Um, there are a couple of silicone 3D printers popping up. But yeah, you do want to, um, you, if they ask for something that reacts the way the tissue does, then we work hard to get them something that's similar. This is an ever ongoing process. We do not have this down by any means. We're, we're definitely amateurs um, in this space. We're not material scientists. Um, but we, we do our best to basically give the surgeons different options that we've created and then have them choose the one that feels the most like the tissue they're trying to replicate. And, and speaking of surgeons, uh, what regulatory requirements are needed for sterile surgical guides? So that's a heavy question. Um, the FDA regulates this space as a class two medical device for surgical guides. Um, the regulation that we're following internally is that of our le hospital leadership board for sterility and safety, as well as our surgical cores. And so the testing that we did before we put these guides into the operating room was to 3D print a set of them, send them off to a third party, and then have them tested for biocompatibility over long term exposure. And well as sterility under the instructions for use and that's what we would recommend to another point of care facility um, if you are a medical device company you have a very uh, different set of guidelines that are um, more geared toward the marketability and um, the safety of the product interesting thank you for that um, let's try to get through two more questions what have you found what have you found are significant barriers to adoption by clinician clinicians um, I think one of the barriers has been uh, when you have someone who's been doing a surgery for 30 years, they, they may not want to have a new tool or, or try a new method, um, but we've found that with those who are open-minded, they, they may um, him and haw a little bit at the beginning, and then um, they'll say, okay, fine, print me a model, and then they won't go back. They just, they will want to be printing models for their complex cases because it gives them so much better insight into the relationships and secondarily gives them an incredible tool for communicating with their patients. Um, secondarily, I think the, the biggest inhibitors are the fact that it's still relatively new at the point of care. Um, I think you need to have financial 
backing, you need to have regulatory support from your institution. Um, but I think what we were able to do successfully because of our fantastic leadership is to prove the concept and prove that, you know, we're not quite sure exactly how helpful it is, but we know it's very helpful. <laughs> and now over the years, the prospective um, double blind data studies um, have shown the effectiveness and we've gotten so far as to create CPT codes um, and a, a registry that is sponsored by the ACR and the RSNA. Um, so the field is becoming more and more legitimate. Um, as the CPT codes move from a category three to a category one, then I think financially driven hospital administration will pay more attention. Interesting. Well, that's a wrap for now. We will send you the additional questions that people do have, but we invite you to come back on Remo and we hope that during the next virtual networking sessions, folks can get in touch with you. Thank you so much, uh, Amy, you. for joining. And sorry for the glitches, but I'm glad we're oh, able to make good. this work. <laughs> Thank Bye, you. Bye, guys. Bye.